Good day. Welcome to the Corey Morgan Show. Last one of September. Where's the time going? Lots to cover today. I got a boondoggle theme going on. I like that word. It's just an odd word. We get to use it so often, unfortunately. It wouldn't be sad if I never had to use it, but we, I'm going to speak on one boondoggle that's kind of local in a moment or two. And I have a guest, author David Sabine, who's going to talk about the Phoenix payroll system boondoggle as well. You hear about that now and then. It's a big one and, and it really needs to be followed up on. I mean, ah, payroll systems, who wants to talk about that? Well, a lot of the civil servants who are trying to get a correct paycheck would like to talk about that. As much as I'm hard on them, they do deserve to get their paychecks right. And of course, us as taxpayers who are paying for these systems would like to talk about that, or at least we need to talk about that. So we'll get to that in a little while as well. I see a few of you checking in on the live scroll already in the comments. Paradoxy, Mr. Stanley, AER, AP. Oh my God, you guys got to make easier names for me. And Jordan, all oh, yeah, there though. Good to see you in there. Use those comments, girls. Discuss things with each other. Send comments my way. It uh, can be interactive and it can be fun. So uh, make use of it. Just stay somewhat civil to each other. We don't have to be nothing but sunshine. I know I'm not, but uh, you know we don't have to be at each other's throats either. All right, let's get on to the first boondoggle, which is uh, locally and in Calgary, but it's still it impacts everybody because these are happening in cities across the country. Municipal governments, they love to throw away the hard-earned money of taxpayers with wild abandon. I mean, the stories of waste and corruption from local governments seem to have no end. And Calgary City Hall has been working hard to outdo itself with the, their boondoggles and waste. I mean, on the low side, Calgary blew $4.8 million tax dollars, and it took them four years to come up with a new slogan for the city. The slogan was Blue Sky City. Yeah, almost $5 million for that, guys. There should be a forensic audit of that ripoff. And then on the high end, Calgary spent $1.4 billion in nine years on an LRT expansion without laying an inch of track. By the time the government finally stepped in from the, the province and pulled the funding from the project, the projected cost of this train line had ballooned from $100,000 per meter to $600,000 per meter. If left alone, Gondex Council of Clowns and inept city administration probably could have pushed the cost of that plan to a million dollars a meter. It's now going to cost another $700 million just to get out of that mess with the contracts. Now we've got a new disaster looming on the horizon, and that's with electric buses. Like most progressive mayors, Jody Gondek has a climate change obsession, and one of her first acts as mayor was to entrench an insane, and it is insane, $87 billion climate plan for the city of Calgary. Yeah, that wasn't a mistaken number. Her plan is to blow $87 billion just in the city of Calgary. Changing Calgary's bus fleet to electric buses is presumably part of that plan. A pilot project was embraced by City Council to purchase 14 electric buses for a cost of about $14 million. The pilot was set to begin in 2022. Well, it's 2024 now and get near towards the uh, tail end of it. The problem is no buses have arrived. The city has constructed charging stations and made plans, but the buses are nowhere to be found. If you look on the city website, a short terse statement Statement was made in August saying the buses are delayed for now. There's some little utterances about supply chain issues. Yes, indeed, there's a supply chain issue. The buses aren't here. This bus supply seems to have collapsed. And if you look at the company the city bought the buses from, it's not hard to see where there's a delay. Vicinity Motor Corporation appears to be on the brink of going broke. Their shares have dropped to penny stock value, and they've only managed to make 11 buses in the last quarter of 2023. They haven't responded to press inquiries, and they're heavily in debt. The odds aren't looking good. For the city and getting either of the buses, of course, of course, a refund on whatever they've spent so far. But oh, it gets worse. In December 2022, the city announced they would go ahead with a $489 million plan to buy and equip 259 electric buses. I mean, when questions were asked why the city's moving forward with this massive purchase despite the pilot project not having started even, people were told, well, the electric bus program in Edmonton was so successful, they decided Calgary didn't need to wait for the pilot to finish. Edmonton's electric electric bus program has been a complete catastrophe. The buses cost a fortune. There were 60 of them. They were found not to work in cold weather. Diesel upgrades had to be added to the buses to heat the motors to make them work at great expense. And then the buses began to break down en masse. But the city couldn't repair them because the company that manufactured them had gone bankrupt. So now they can't get spare parts and two thirds of the buses are out of service. $60 million, folks. Now, the first of Calgary's 259 electric buses is supposed to be in service in a year or two, I believe. They're all supposed to be in use not too long after that. But when you consider the pilot program buses have been, they've been lost in the mix somewhere after years, it comes hard to believe that this larger order is going to be arriving anytime soon. So where's the city 
add with the procurement of this massive electric fleet, what's the progress been to date and how much has been spent already? Well, they're not telling anybody. As with the Green Line, the city's keeping the information hidden as deeply as possible. Citizens, you got to get up and demand a progress report from the city for this half billion dollar bus program. And if the city can't demonstrate it's moving along smoothly, it must pull the plug on this thing immediately. These things only get worse with more time and sinking more money in. Have they spent the money already? Have they already equipped bus barns with 259 charging stations to languish empty, uh, waiting, you know, as the pilot program has been going? I mean, we likely won't get answers until the program implodes and most of the current council along with the mayor have probably been replaced by then. But we've got a chance to stop this train wreck or bus wreck, if you want to call it that. Either way, when the time comes, nobody can pretend we didn't see it coming. I'm warning you now, guys, and don't act surprised when this falls apart in a year or two or whatever it might be. All right, that's what's got me going. That's boondoggle number one for today. Let's check in with our news editor, Dave Naylor, and see what else is going on in the big bad world out there. And there he is from the newsroom. Dave Naylor, how you doing, Dave? Oh, I'm missing you, Corey. Normally, I'm sitting right beside you. I know, I know, but we've got a bit of a camera shortage today, so we've had to re rely on you in the old seats there in the newsroom. Yeah, I understand it's uh, halfway to Edmonton now, and uh, hey, you and I are heading up there uh, right after the show. We are indeed, yes, the, the Ted Toasting Ted event for Ted Byfield. Uh, I'll try not to terrorize you too much on the drive. Can I sit in the back seat so it's like a real Uber experience? <laughs> you certainly can, and I can uh, scowl at you in the rearview mirror like I typically do. Awesome, looking forward to it. Uh, yeah, we've had a had a busy morning as usual here on the uh, uh, in the newsroom. You you were alive back in 1947, right? Uh, almost, almost. Well, that was the last time you could buy a chocolate bar for five cents. It was in 1947, and that's exactly where Alberta natural gas price is today at five cents, uh, which is not very good. It's uh, it's almost cheaper to to keep it in the ground, but. Uh, our energy expert, uh, Sean Polzer, has got a story up there uh, explaining it all. And uh, he's actually at a press conference uh, right now with Premier Smith. And he's going to ask her uh, uh, about that because it's going to cause some big budgeting problems, too, because the, the, the province has budgeted that for it to be at uh, $2.20 gig as well. And right now it's $0.05, cents, so uh, not very good at all. We've got a strange story about an Indiana guy. I don't know if... Uh, Nico can pull his face up on the screen, but it's a face that only a mother could love. He uh, he strangled an 11-month-old baby, and then when he was in prison, he decided uh, he would be much more comfortable in a in a women's prison. Uh, so he's uh, applied for a sex change operation, and the judge down there has ruled uh, the taxpayers' money will be used to pay for it, which has sparked uh, outrage in uh, Indiana, as you uh, might expect. Uh, some drama in Saskatchewan yesterday with a fugitive armed robbery suspect uh, uh, was spotted at a, on a First Nations base there and a, a police, a big police chase ended up with shots fired and his vehicle driving into a field and, uh, and that's where he, uh, he died despite the, uh, the, the aid of paramedics. The Saskatchewan Court of Appeal has finished listening to uh, 11 interveners on the, uh, the, the uh, what's it called, the pa Parents' Bill of Rights. Uh, that's sort of a, making sure parents are informed whenever their uh, child wants to uh, change gender. So they've heard arguments on both sides and have reserved judgment in that. And you'll remember Thomas Lukasik, a name from your past, Corey, a former Tory cabinet minister who managed to blow $20,000 uh, on a cell phone bill when he was on holiday in Europe. Uh, he's been doing nothing but lambaste the UCP for the last couple of years. And they finally had enough and they announced they were ripping up his UCP membership. Uh, so our Jonathan Bradley's got a story on that. So uh, lo lots more stuff up there, Corey, but I'll uh, I'll uh, leave it for the viewers to take a look themselves. Right on. Well, yeah, Fabio is no longer a member of the UCP. Maybe he'll finally formally join the NDP where he probably belongs anyhow. You know, certainly that's what he sounds like the last couple of years. <laughs> right. I'm, sure, uh, I'm sure Mr. Nenshi will be happy to take him. I don't know if the room could fit both of their egos, but it'd be interesting to see them try. <laughs> Indeed. All right. Thanks, Dave. I'll uh, see you after the show as we whip off up to Edmonton there. Sounds good. Right on. So this is when I like to remind everybody the reason we got Dave working and hustling in the newsroom and Jonathan Bradley writing those stories and Sean Polzer out at the press conferences is because you guys have subscribed. So this is where I got to nag you and remind you. Get on there. WesternStandard.news slash subscription. We don't take tax dollars, which means we 
can report things as we see them. We don't have to uh, suck up to the liberal government like CTV did by doctoring clips of the leader of the opposition or things like that. We answer to you guys. But we do need you guys to step up and subscribe. That's how we can do it. You know, it's just like a newspaper subscription. You get past that paywall, $10 a month, $100 for a year. It's a good deal, guys. Get on there, westernstandard.news slash subscription. Take one out. And if you've already subscribed, thank you. We really, really do appreciate it. We do. Right, you know, some of this stuff, this, this parent's bill of rights and this stuff that's going on, and we're seeing that in Alberta, we're seeing the discussions. I mean, because the crazed trans activists, and they are, they're crazed. They, they just keep pushing the limit and pushing the limit. I mean, I'm libertarian minded. I have no issues. If, if you're a grown person, you can do whatever the heck you please with yourself. I don't care. It's your business. If everybody's consenting, do what you like. I'm more than happy for you. But they got to go for the kids. They can't leave the kids alone. The lunacy, the ridiculousness. A, a story that Dave didn't mention that's on the Western Standard site, too, is in Saskatchewan, some, some brochure on lesbian bds and sex techniques, including fisting. If you really want to make yourself feel pale, you can Google that. You don't need to. It's stuff that kids don't need brought into their schools. But these activists keep pushing it in there. And parents have the right to know what's being presented to their children even if you don't agree with what the parents' views are. Public schools have to answer to the parents. It can't be the other way around. Yet these activists keep trying to wedge themselves in. They keep trying to get in the way. And they're telling parents they don't have the right to know what their kid is up to at the school. I'm sorry, that's wrong. And Saskatchewan has put in this parents' bill of rights to say, we're going to make sure that's protected. And they, they look, chances are, even if the idiot judges, and I'm afraid a lot of them are fools, will say that this is unconstitutional, that's for, uh, you know, it violates the charter, that's fine. You know, apparently is a charter right for children to hide things from their parents and have the schools stand between the parents and their children. Uh, they'll use the notwithstanding clause. So, I mean, the one thing we'll give credit to is it, uh, Pierre is giving out the notwithstanding clause to see past these things. The government's job is not to raise our children. It's not to get between us and our children. It's ironic and sad and funny when you see these same activists, these left activists and so on, going on about residential schools. Well, that's a prime example of what happens when the government takes over the raising of children versus the parents. That's what happens when the government says the parents don't have the right to say where their children should be educated, how they should be educated, or even know what's going on in the school. Think about that. Did you guys learn anything from that then? I mean, we've got a lot of hyperbole and untruths and, and things that we can cover about what happened at the uh, residential schools, but there was a lot of terrible things happened at them. I mean, it was certainly an attempt to take a culture and jam it into a, a modern perspective that they weren't ready for, and it did mess up a whole lot of people, and we're still dealing with the fallout from it today. Part of that was because the government felt it was in the place to step in between the parents and their children. And how did that work out? Yet now we're doing the same bloody thing. We're saying parents actually don't even have a legal right to know what their kids are up to in the schools. No, no, guys, the parents have every right. In fact, it's essential that the parents know what's going on in there. The other thing that in my view that this leads to then is a better case for a voucher system for breaking up the school. School choice, let parents choose what they want. If you want your kids to go to a woke school, fine. Again, that's your choice as a parent. But if you don't want any of that trash, it should be your choice as a parent to send your child to a school that doesn't deal with that. We just need a base core curriculum, of course, to prepare them for a career and future and a life. And after that, we should have school choice so parents can choose where their kids go to so they can get what they need without uh, embracing the rest of the trash that gets shoved in together with it. I find it funny when you listen to teachers when they fight against standardized testing because they say every child learns differently. You can't standardize test because it's not fair because this child responds this way and that child responds that way. I agree. But then shouldn't we have all different kinds of schools then to address the different needs of all those kids? Oh, no, 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 no. When it comes to that, then they all have to be standardized schools that are controlled by the school boards and of course wagged uh, you know, by the tail of the teachers' unions. Well, you can't have it both ways there, guys. We either address the unique needs of different children in education, or we don't. But the hypocrisy uh, never seems to end when it comes to, from some of those unions and such. All right, but either way, I, I'm going to be actually saying something nice about it. Some of the union folks who I'm usually beating on, which is our federal civil servants, because as I said, I'd like to see it reduced. I'd like to see it cut down. I'd like to see it streamlined. But I don't feel 
that they should be abused for not having their payroll properly managed. They have that right, and it has not been done well since 2016. So we're going to bring my guest, David Sabine, in. He, he's an author. He wrote uh, a book uh, on the Phoenix payroll system called Phoenix, and uh, he's going to talk to us about it today. So thanks for joining me today, uh, Mr. Uh, David. Hello, Corey. Thanks for having me. So, you know, I guess just to give some background, people have heard of the Phoenix system. Uh, I, I read most of the book. I didn't get all the way through it quite yet, but uh, uh, part of it was, I mean, it wasn't even originally called the Phoenix system, but there was a big change that was happening kind of a little bit before Stephen Harper, and then it came in during Stephen Harper's time. This is one I don't even want to point at specific parties because it's had multiple parties in charge, and this disaster has kept rolling along. Uh, give a bit of background, though. What happened? How did we get into this mess? It's a great question. Uh, we should talk about how the mess began, and then let's talk about when it blew up. And so uh, let me explain first the word phoenix. The mythical phoenix is reborn from its ashes. So we need to ask, from which ashes was this phoenix project supposed to rise? And here's a quick history. Uh, a core operation of our federal government is to pay the public servants. And you would think that having to issue paychecks every two weeks, that they would be good at it by now. Uh, they're not. And so by Mulroney's term in office, it was apparent that our government had cobbled together a bunch of IT systems. It was difficult to maintain, difficult to keep up to date. And so in the last weeks of his term and when power was transitioning over to Kim Campbell, uh, his government signed a $45 million contract with Accenture. The goal of that contract was to modernize the pension systems and the pay systems of the federal government. Now, of course, we know Kim Campbell didn't win that election. John Cretchen won that election. And immediately he terminated the contract. And so uh, nothing but ashes, you know, uh, Accenture took us to court or took the federal government to court. There was a settlement. The, the Canadian public doesn't know the details of that settlement, but litigation took a decade. And so 10 years later, now we're talking 2004, five, six, the senior bureaucrats had renewed interest in the project. They estimated it would cost about $6 million, but the scope of it continued to increase. Uh, Stephen Harper's government then was persuaded to spend about $300 million to replace the payroll systems and to centralize the payroll staff into one single office. That's how the mess began. So, I mean, kind of, I mean, we'll cover some more of the details in between, but fast forward to today, some of the estimates on what this has cost is getting into $4 billion. I mean, when you started at $6 million, you got up to a few hundred million, and now we're up to $4 billion, and that's just the taxpayer's cost. And then uh, hundreds of thousands of payments over the years have been messed up. Some people have been overpaid, some have been underpaid, some have been paid at all. That, that's a cost that we can't even begin to measure. Uh, is the, the bleeding stemming at all yet? Not at all. And, and so let's go back to 2016 for a minute. Justin Trudeau's government greenlighted the launch of the project. Uh, Phoenix had been delayed a number of times under Stephen Harper's government. Everyone knew it wasn't ready and no one was ready to launch it. Justin Trudeau was elected and MP Judy Foote was given this file. And then her and her senior advisors agreed to launch the system in March 9 of 2016. So the system at that time was used to uh, calculate the, the, pay, the paychecks of about 120,000 of the roughly 200,000 uh, public servants at the time, 40,000 of those paychecks in that first uh, pay run were incorrect. And so you, your question is, are we still hemorrhaging uh, money? And, and yes, we are. We're throwing money at this ever since. The error rate today, the backlog of corrections that need to be made today is as large as it was in 2016. So as of today, 408,000 payroll errors await resolution. And every two weeks, there are more errors, they fix some, there are more errors, they fix some, there are more errors. It's It's been a disaster ever since 2016. Yeah, and, and you know, we saw, it was frustrating to read it, if, for, for people familiar with Yes Minister, uh, you know, it's an English uh, sitcom about, you know, a minister getting snowed, snowed by his uh, bureaucrats who were talking to him, you know, when things would fail and so on, and they would double speak. But some of those committee meetings, when they would talk to some of the uh, you know, asking about this, they just couldn't get any straight answers out of the senior bureaucrats on it. And I believe it was Foote who said at one point that she called it a success in the first little bit of a run. How could you have such a massive error rate and call it a success? Yeah, it's it's, it's amazing the double think that uh, you can read into the committee minutes. Uh, so I wrote the book, uh, your question earlier was about costs. You know, I wrote the book 
just over a year ago, I calculated that the taxpayer had already spent 4.2 billion. And I should qualify that number. And I actually think journalists should really dig in uh, and debate these numbers uh, more deliberately. So first, most journalists go with the government's own uh, estimates, 3.2 or 3.5 billion. But those numbers include the direct costs and the large settlement that was paid out to the, uh, the to the union members, but they exclude the costs associated with replacing the Phoenix system. And there's a huge number of projects underway uh, in that regard. And they exclude, uh, and, and this is where my unique expertise was helpful. I looked at the full list of ongoing large IT projects and I found numerous integration projects. And so for example, $33 million was spent to integrate the systems at CBSA, CRA, Parks Canada, RCMP. This money is spent only because Phoenix exists and only because its capabilities are so incompatible with the needs of those departments. And so if we include all of those integration projects, uh, as of a year ago, I calculated $4.2 billion had gone through this inferno. Yeah. And I mean, it, it's, uh, it sounds like there's work being done. I, you know, I started looking and digging because we do hear about it peri periodically erupts, but it never seems to get solved. Uh, they're going to replace it with something called day force or they're, they're easing into that system now. Uh, do you think they're going to be more careful? I mean, it sounds like they're going to phase it in rather than try it. Cause I mean, something that large, you can't just flick a switch and change systems. You do have to try to uh, integrate it. But at the same time, they're trying to fix 500,000 other errors that they still have built up. Yeah, good point. I mean, so they are taking a more incremental approach, I think, uh, with this new initiative. However, Corey, you know, where there's smoke, there's fire. Uh, Day Force, it used to be called Ceridian. They won the contract to replace Phoenix. And there's virtually nothing known about their involvement or McKinsey's. So we can see those two uh, companies show up in some committee minutes, but they're you go to the website, you, you find for uh, for projects or RFPs or uh, line items in the annual budget, and, and there's very little to discover there. I think there are many questions. For example, why did Navdeep Baines step down? Why did Navdeep Baines' chief of staff suddenly become an executive at Dayforce? Uh, and, and why did the CEO of Dayforce tell reporters after the 2021 election uh, he told reporters that Justin Trudeau's cabinet had requested that Dayforce not publicize the fact that they had won the contract until after the election. Um, it, it appears Justin Trudeau or or one of his cabinet members specifically asked to keep that a secret during the campaign until until after the election. Why was that? I think there's a lot of questions to be asked about their involvement and what's going on. There always are. And, and, you know, people always have to be careful about But when you get a government contract with that large amount of money and, and, is, and their history of bad controls on it, you know the opportunists are going to come out of the woodworks. I mean, it just happens. It's the way it goes. So, I mean, it, whether Dayforce is right or wrong, it's, it's not unprecedented for an organization to have a payroll this large in modern times. I mean, Canada, we've got a workforce of about 420,000, which is really huge for civil service, but still... There are a lot of companies and governments and others who have uh, payrolls as large or larger than this. And are they operating more successfully than us? Well, if I could take a moment here, like we need to do this differently. Issuing paychecks every two weeks to public servants is a core operation of the government, as you said. And we're talking about basic math and well-known accounting techniques. Like this kind of software is not magic. The business rules, while complicated, and there are 80 plus collective bargaining agreements, and that certainly makes things more difficult, uh, but the requirements are known and programmable. So I believe, and so your question is, are others doing this better than the federal government of Canada? Well, some are, some governments also have their own boondoggles, but I think it comes down to a simple question between lesser evils. The government could do this in-house. Certainly the taxpayer employs an army of IT professionals and software developers, and they could build a purpose-built tool to, to operate this, uh, this, this core operation of the government. Or the government could continue to outsource this stuff to giant multinationals who supposedly have the expertise, but they continue to fail and they, re they repeatedly fail to deliver. So both of these options are ripe for waste and corruption. 
But we need to think back to 2005 and six and seven. What were the conditions of that time before Stephen Harper was persuaded to sign the, uh, the approval of that first $300 million? Let's think back to that time. Many bureaucrats and MPs complained about the existing payroll systems. They were 40 years old, they were hard to maintain, and I don't doubt that. But let's remember that those systems were successfully conducting paychecks every two weeks for 190,000 employees. The error rate was very, very low, much lower than today's error rate with Phoenix. But the MPs latched on to this Phoenix myth. You know, they were absolutely taken on faith and with no empirical evidence that the old systems just needed to be replaced and that a commercial system, you know, purchased from some multinational company was the way to replace them. Now, both of those ideas were the result of, I think, just a bandwagon effect. To your question, lots of other jurisdictions, they've tried the same. They've bought systems off the shelf. Uh, off the shelf. They call them COTS products or commercial off the shelf products. Um, and their, their mileage may vary, you, know, you might say, but our government is absolutely addicted to these giant IT replacement projects. Is the taxpayer just on the hook every five years to throw billions of dollars at the cronies of the day to replace these IT systems? I think we need to start asking these kinds of questions. Absolutely. I mean, uh, yeah, you know, uh, kind of a funny comment out of Mr. Stanley, but he's probably dead right. You know, he says, I bet the Phoenix employees still receive their pay on time. Yeah, when you're inside, you can make sure that uh, your check uh, comes through. But, uh, you know, and, and I'm kind of bouncing around, but I'll bounce back. I mean, something you mentioned in the book, and it's interesting, when politics gets mixed into things, that's usually when the trouble comes about. So uh, one of the things Prime Minister Stephen Harper did in his time was getting rid of the old boondoggle of the Liberal Gun Registry. And part of that was they bought themselves Love and Mirror Machine New Brunswick by setting up the administration offices there. So now they had to lay off loads and loads of civil servants who were running this, this terribly inept gun registry. Harper thought he could kill two birds with one stone and said, well, we will re-employ them with this new payroll system. So they took those bureaucrats and just kind of shuffled them into something they weren't necessarily qualified to embrace, but it was a way to patch a hole and try and maintain a seat. Uh, it, it's, you know, this is just typical of governments, unfortunately. Well, I think any other prime minister might have made the same calculation Stephen Harper did. Uh, to, to If the goal was to centralize this operation into one office, there were just a few offices across the country that were suitable for this with available staff. So I don't begrudge his decision on that point. But it also is interesting to note that it takes about two years for the payroll staff to be properly trained so that they can conduct this work. Why does it take two years? Well, part of that is because uh, the, the regulations are so complex. There are 80, 80 and more collective bargaining agreements. Um, the systems are difficult to use, and and then they they burn out. So so of all the people that start the process to learn how to become a payroll advisor in our government, only about forty percent of them continue the training. Two years later, sixty percent of them have quit and left, and, and so that speaks to the difficulty of the job, but also the the, the you know the nightmare that is this this work environment. Well, yeah, and plus just the, the competency. I mean, if you have a high turnover, then you're not going to have offices with lo well, long-term experienced people to apply themselves to issues. But I guess if you're applying yourself and you can't fix anything, that, that's how you end up burnt out. Uh, What's what interesting, if I could add, Corey, to that point, the solutions, the best, so if we look at how the government has burned through that er that er the, the errors that have occurred, uh, and we look at how have they done that most effectively, it's usually that a small group of experienced people have come together, they work together as a pod, and they burn through a backlog of errors and they fix them. Uh, the solution here is people, not some belief in some magical system that we can buy from a multinational co corporation. Oh, well, there's not going to be any quick magic bullet, that's for sure. And, and uh, I mean, that's part of why you've written a book on it. The time has run out quickly because it's, it's such a big issue here. But uh, I'm certain you're going to continue to watch this and be speaking on it. So where can people find your book and, and where can they find you to, to keep up on what's going on as hopefully this government or the next government gets on to solving the, this uh, issue so they can move on to solving many others? Thanks, Corey, for that. Uh, they can find me at uh, davidsabine.ca. 
Uh, and David davidsabine.ca slash phoenix, that'll take you right to a page where you can look at the book. You can buy it at Amazon on uh, paperback or Kindle version, or you can buy it at Lean Pub as well. Uh, find me on LinkedIn, I'm active there. And on X, I'd be happy to connect with people. Great. Well, uh, thank you for taking the time to, to join us today and for watching this issue and digging into it. Like I said, you know, some of these things seem kind of dry and they're, they're bookkeeping sort of things and stuff like that. But uh, boy, it's not so dry and, and unimportant when you're the one whose check hasn't shown up on time or, uh, you know, when you're when you're working in a department that's spinning its wheels and burning you out. So uh, it's true. I, you know, some some people have lost their savings. They've lost their homes. It's been a disaster all around. Really, I, th I appreciate that you brought me on to talk, to talk about it. Great. Well, we'll keep bringing it up and can't let them forget it. And hopefully, uh, as I said, hopefully that problem gets solved because there's many others for them to work on. So uh, perhaps we'll talk again soon and uh, we'll be talking about a solution at that time. Thank you, Corey. Great. Thanks, David. So again, yes, David Sabine, you can look him up. As he said, he's on uh, LinkedIn and, and on X out there, and he's got that book, Phoenix. Uh, if you look it up, it's on Amazon and other spots like that. Yeah, just a massive, massive bureaucracy. I mean, again, you know, bureaucracies screw up a lot of things. That's hardly new. This one's one of the ones when it takes a lot. As I said, I love ripping into bureaucrats and civil servants, but when you get me feeling sympathetic, uh for civil servants, you know it's got to be pretty bad. Paradox, he's saying, I find myself struggling to be sympathetic with the unionized striking bureaucracy that keeps supporting liberals. Yeah, fair enough. But either way, if we're going to run a government, if you're going to hire people, if you're going to have them on a payroll, you have to pay them. You have to pay them properly and on time. That's just morality. That's just doing the right thing. And it's also not doing us any favors. As we said, with as upset and crabby and, and low production as civil servants are, well, this is one of the areas that contributes to it, isn't it? You know, when your morale is in the toilet because you haven't been paid consistently, uh, you're not going to perform really well. You're not going to work really hard. You're not going to, you know, go out of your way to do anything uh, better with it. All right, so let's look at that House of Commons, that gong show that we've got of the people who are running our country, that minority thing. Uh, the, the confidence vote as of this time for folks who aren't watching it live hasn't been held yet, I believe. But, uh, you know, it's going to fail. I mean, I'll make that prediction right now. I mean, if, if the government falls somehow, if the block changed its mind or, or something, uh, you know, I'll, I'll, uh, I'll report on that and talk about it on the next show. But as far as things look right now, uh, Pierre Polyev, you know, is putting the motion forward and it's going to fail. But it's showing the opportunism and the weakness of the other parties that are out there. The Bloc Québécois has ramped up the demands even more to keep holding the government in power. They want more legislation to entrench the supply management system, which is the dairy system, which is Soviet style, which rips off Canada all the time. You wonder about your high dairy and chicken costs? That's where it's at. And he wants that deeper entrenched. He also wants some OAS things increased, which again, which would benefit Quebec. The only thing I'll give to the Bloc Québécois is they're honest. You know, they really are. They're the most honest party out there. Party Quebec, Bloc Québécois, all the way back to René Lévesque. They say, hey, we're here for Quebec and only Quebec, and we don't really care about the rest of the country. They don't They, they don't dislike the rest of Canada. I, I met with Bloc members back when I led the Alberta Independence Party. They don't dislike us. They're indifferent to us. They don't care. They're there for Quebec, and they make no bones about it. So when they find now that Jagmeet Singh has played his little game, and it's a little game, saying, I'm no longer, I'm ripping up my agreement with Justin Trudeau, we're not going to hold them up any longer, even though Singh already came around and said, well, actually, we will keep holding him up because we're a bunch of losers with no money in the bank. We can't run an election. Uh, the Bloc stepped up and said, well, we can make sure you stay in power, Justin. We can keep you safe. We just want this and this and this. You think they're going to stop at that? No. Every time a confidence vote comes, the Bloc is going to lay out their demands for getting Trudeau through it. And they're going to keep doing it because as long as they're getting their demands, why would they stop, right? Unfortunately, the rest of us get to pay that price for a wildly incompetent, wildly unpopular prime minister clinging to power in this country. The system is broken. It really is. And, uh, you know, again, I'm, <laughs> that's a whole separate show as to what I feel we need to do about it. I wrote a book on that if you want to look up my authorship. But in the time that we're stuck with now, what is Justin Trudeau doing in this time of crisis? What is he doing when his government is sitting there teetering on the brink of falling, madly unpopular? Well, he's down doing 
TV shows in the United States. Yes, he's sitting with Colbert and giggling and playing footsie and playing celebrity. Yeah, it's not doing him any favors up here. We got some issues to deal with, Justin. But no, he runs away. He hides. That's what he does. He's a coward. He is not a leader. He's there because of his name. And uh, he's now there just because we haven't the mechanism or the ability to kick him out yet. We can't get rid of him. We can't get an election brought forth yet. The time will come eventually. It'll be interesting. It, it, it shows, though, how bereft of ideas this government is, how, how exhausted they are. With, of, of any, I mean, what we're seeing now is deeper and deeper boondoggles. We're seeing more and more spending initiatives. We're seeing a lot of them feathering their nests. They know they're going down. We're seeing the appointments to the Senate. We're seeing some big contracts that are going to be laid out. This is the tail end of what's going to happen. But uh, Trudeau, if they really thought they had a hope of, of, of winning, of turning it around, they got about a year to do it. They haven't changed anything. They haven't changed their lines. They haven't brought in any really significantly new policies. They haven't uh, said they're going to do anything differently. When you're down into record low support territory, you won't even shuffle your cabinet. You are a broken government. So no wonder he runs away and hides to uh, try and you know avoid the problem, leaves the rest of the government to have to deal with it. Similar to a couple of years ago. We're coming up on... The uh, Kamloops Residential School uh, hoax day, uh, I, I think they call it the Truth and Reconciliation Day, it's the, the holiday that Justin Trudeau created after the hoax of the Kamloops Residential School body thing broke. And I'm going to keep calling it a hoax. I know some people chafe every time I say that. But you know what? I'm getting sick of it. I'm getting really, really, really sick of it. When all the evidence is pointing to the fact that there wasn't a single bloody body there. We turned the country upside down. A hundred churches got burned and vandalized. Billions were spent. Millions were given to these reserves to find these murdered children. And it turns out there weren't any. We kept the flag at half-mast for six months. We didn't even do that after the wars. And it didn't happen. There weren't any bodies. And yes, as Paradoxy points out, calls it Surf and Recreation Day, because what? It shows how tone deaf, how shallow, how stupid Justin Trudeau is. If you're going to do a political thing like create a holiday, the first thing you would be expected to do is be cutting a ribbon, giving a speech over at one of these things. So what happened on the first holiday? Where was Justin at? He was surfing. He went surfing. Yeah. So their term for it is Truth and Reconciliation Day. There's where I get a lot, this is where I start getting upset and I get sick of things. Because you can't have reconciliation without the truth. And they don't want the truth. The truth is, we need to get a shovel in at Kamloops. It's been years now, over three years. A shovel is supposedly 200 murdered children are buried there. And dig one up. We need to try and find the killers. We need to try and find what happened. But we can't, of course, because there's nobody there. It's idiocy. It's wrong. And it's ripping the nation apart. It's entrenching more of a sense of victimhood amongst the First Nations people who are already in a socioeconomic disaster on the reserves and off and off reserve when they come off there. And when we continue with this divisive crap, it makes it worse. It makes more of that us-them mentality. And it just entrenches the mess that they're in and the mess that we're all stuck dealing with too. So... This is the government we have right now. We need somebody else in there, but we just can't get the chance. And what do we got also with what Trudeau's been doing? We saw some great evidence. And this is where we'll pat ourselves on the back again on being independent media, because as I said earlier, we only answer to you. You do dance with the one that brung you. That's life, right? When someone's paying your bills, you tend to lean towards who's paying your bills. In our case, it's the subscribers, which is great. We serve you. So what happens with media outlets when they get subsidized by the government? Who do they suddenly answer to? Who are they suddenly beholden to? CTV showed it in spades the other day when they actually, it, it's unbelievable. They took, a, I mean, media bias is nothing new. That's been happening since the, the first Gutenberg press put out a, 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 a sheet to give to people news. There was bias there. That's fine. But to the degree of CTV now, taking government subsidies, whining for more government subsidies, and uh, they took a clip of Pierre Polyev and actually hacked it into different pieces and reassembled it so he was saying something completely different than what he was saying. They really did that. 
And now, yeah, Polyev, rightly furious. He was, they basically made it look as if Polyev was trying to pull the government down on the confidence vote so that they could get rid of the dental plan. That, that, that's what they did. That's actually what they did. And CTV put out this apology when they were caught on it and said, oh, it was a mistake. We made an error. You don't accidentally take a video and splice it into a few chunks and reassemble it to make it a completely different message by mistake. Oh, I dropped the disc on the floor and it came back differently. No, it doesn't work that way, you morons. You put out pure falsehood. And yeah, so Polyev will not, no Conservative Party members now will give any interviews or time or clips to the CTV until they apologize for purposely doing it. You see, they apologize for a mistake, but that's a load of BS. It wasn't a mistake. It clearly wasn't a mistake. Some heads should roll. That's what you need to see. You need to see these producers in this department went way over the line. We are sorry for that. We've fired them and we've put these mechanisms in place to make sure that doesn't happen again. But no, they said, oh, it was an error. Well, then fine. Screw you. We won't give you any more time. Why is CTV taking such a beating like this? Well, it's because they have to keep the liberals happy because they're subsidized, like the newspapers. <laughs> like, this is what happens when government runs the media. They don't have to directly run it. It doesn't have to be directly Pravda style like the CBC. They can indirectly do it through subsidies. Because again, when they control who does or doesn't get these subsidies, then the, the outlet is going to dance to their tune. And that's exactly what CTV is doing, is dancing to the tune of Trudeau's liberals. Speaking of other subsidies, why not, right? The electric vehicle binge, the, the lunacy, the, 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 the mad rush. I mean, God, we've been hearing about how everybody's going to switch to electric vehicles for, what, 15 years now? And what's the general use of them on the streets still? 5%? Six. It's, it, we aren't massively embracing these things yet. Maybe we never mail, will. Maybe we will. I don't know. But leave the bloody market alone because you can't force it. That's what's happening with these stupid electric buses that are failing all over. And then with the massive subsidies being given out for electric cars and battery plants. So that's what Trudeau put out, $50 billion and more to these battery plants out in Ontario. Meanwhile, Ford is backing off on their electric vehicles. I think Audi's backing off. All the private manufacturers saying, we're getting out of this for now. We're not totally getting out, but we're backing off because people aren't buying the damn things. Well, now, Northvolt, a Swedish uh, battery maker, uh, yeah. Uh, this is one of the ones that the Trudeau government's really been, you know, uh, hand in hand with and saying, you know, this is what we're subsidizing our battery plants with and everything else. Well, what have they done over in Sweden? Oh, they've uh, cut 1,600 jobs in their plants. Why? Because nobody wants the freaking batteries. We're making batteries for vehicles that nobody wants. But where are we going? We're screwed. <laughs> He's throwing that money. But where's the money going? You see, where's the money going? We're not building these plants in... Southern Manitoba or Saskatchewan, Alberta. No, 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 no. Quebec. Quebec. It's always Quebec. You know, I, I saw an article saying recently that separatism is rising. It's ugly head in Quebec again. It's getting big. It was never gone, guys. It was never gone. If you, if you spoke to some independence-minded Quebecois people before, you realize they, they are serious about it. They really want to go. If people say, well, they're going to take an economic hit if they go. Yeah, I know. They know that too. They don't care. They just want their French state, even if it costs them more money. That's what some Albertans have difficulty recognizing sometimes. They, why would they pause? They're threatening. They're not real about it. They, they, they would cost them money. No, they don't get it. They don't care about the cost. I mean, they'll take the money whenever the government's throwing it at them, of course. But they don't care if it's going to cost them to get out. So it is raising its head. It's growing again. They're moving towards another referendum. The bloc might be back in power in Quebec. But you know what? Good. Good. We've got to be diff different this time. When they voted to stay by only 1% back in the 90s, when they voted that close, that was after a giant campaign from the West, uh, rest of Canada saying, we love you, Quebec, please stay, Quebec, please, please, please stay, Quebec. You're our friends, you're our brothers, you're our cousins. Stay with Canada. We don't want you to go. Next referendum, let's try a different tactic. Don't let the door hit your ass on the way out. We should be inviting them to go. Go ahead, leave. Please, 
save Canada by leaving Canada, because that's the truth of it. We, Our constitution is supposed to be a living document. It's a dead one. It's obsolete. It doesn't serve the regions. It doesn't reflect the needs and growth of the country. And we can't change it. We tried and failed with the Charlottetown Accord. We tried and failed with Meech Lake. We can't even revise the Constitution in relatively minor ways. So the only way we're going to change that document, that agreement, it's an engine that's broken. we got to tear it down and rebuild it. And the only crisis that's going to be big enough to make people ready to embrace and do that will be a province pulling out of Canada. And as much as I certainly would like to see Alberta independence movements growing, Quebec is much closer to it than we are. So let's help them along with it for all of our sake. Go. Please go leave and then we can rebuild this from there we can come up with a new agreement we can come up with a new union between the bunch of us or by have a bunch of independent states within who knows but it will be superior to the mess that we're in right now look up i'll close the show on that i hate to go off in a negative but look up gdp per capita that's basically the measure of wealth in canada and i tell you what guys it's going in the toilet the amount of money per person has been going down for decade and it's not going to turn around we're losing. When you go to the States, you see those houses you can buy for a fraction of the cost of a Canadian house, and you look at the average income, it's higher than the income up here, and the groceries are cheaper. That's our neighbor. Look at the trend we're going on. We've got to break this country down and rebuild it and fix it. All right, I, that's all my time for today, guys. Again, if you're in Edmonton, I check into it. The uh, Toasting Ted event is on tonight. We're going to be going up there. I'm not sure. I think there's still tickets available. You can have a look if you just Google Toasting Ted. Uh, be sure to check out the Pipeline. Dave hosted it this week. Uh, yes, we have a strange schedule going on. And uh, check out our other shows. Share the links with others, guys. Be sure to subscribe to The Standard. And yes, thank you very much again for joining in today. We will be back again next week at this time, and uh, I'll have a whole new set of things to gripe about. Have a good one out there, guys. Thanks.